Welcome to the American Football Stories podcast brought to you by Coach Paint. Today is November 9th, 2020. I'm your host, Nick Knudsen. My co-host, Robert Parker, is joining us tonight on today's episode. We'll recap week nine of the NFL. What time is it? Damn, damn. It's going to be special. They're going to talk about this forever. Welcome to American Football Stories. Puts his head down, crashes and spins and dives. Touchdown! Bringing together the many perspectives that make up college football in the NFL. Football is one of the greatest sports ever invented. From players and coaches. Believe, baby, believe, baby. And we're playing to win right here, fellas. To the front office and scouts. The public is finally beginning to catch up, but they don't even know half the truth. Let's get the world, let's get it. Your hosts, Robert Parker and Nick Knudsen, bring you... American Football Stories. All right, let's first go over the bye weeks. Cincinnati, Cleveland, LA Rams, and Philly all had the week off. Thursday night, we started our week in San Francisco, and we watched the beat-up 49ers get beat up by the Green Bay Packers. Pack looked great, 405 yards uh, on the day. Aaron Rodgers was just lighting things up with Devontae Adams. And I think we're finally starting to see it. I've been talking about it for a few weeks now. The 49ers are finally starting to crumble. We we saw the foundation cracking. I've been pointing at it for a while now. Niners are done this season, Rob. You ready to sell that stock? Yeah, uh, I'm ready to sell the stock. Stick a fork in them. They're, they're definitely done. Um, just a lot of injuries, you know, uh, total annihilation on the Packers and Aaron Rodgers just dropping dimes all over the field to Devontae Adams. But is it me or or is it just seems like this this Packers team just plays better on the offense side of the ball when Aaron Jones is, is fully healthy? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Jones is a big difference maker. He only got 15 touches on this particular night, but I, I he's been battling a little bit of a calf injury. I know Green Bay, they don't rush these guys back, though. I remember, wasn't it just a couple weeks ago, Devontae Adams was complaining because he's like, I can go, I can go. And they're like, nah, take your time. I think they, they're kind of doing the same thing where they're not really forcing Aaron Jones into heavy-duty action just yet, right? Yeah, um, you know, I, I know that that running back room actually kind of suffered a couple uh, COVID cases, uh, A.J. Dillon and, and, and Williams. So I, it kind of seemed like, they did kind of rush Aaron Jones back a little bit, but that was kind of out of net necessity. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this coming week, um, you know, moving forward, he, he won't be, you know, a workhorse back that he, he has been um, as, as he was early in the season before he got hurt. Right, right. Yeah, I think I think you can definitely see a reduced workload for him, but still quite an impact because even though he only has 11 carries, he had five receptions as well. So 16 touches on the day, that's pretty good for anyone. All right, the Denver Broncos. Let's go to Sunday at 1 o'clock. They fall to Atlanta 34-27. Atlanta has just totally screwed up my Trevor Lawrence theory with the Falcons. They're playing some good ball under Raheem Morris. Uh, Rob, almost blew the game at the end. Are the Falcons playing good enough where Raheem Morris Morris is going to get consideration for this job? I, I think they are. And, and I mean, move, moving forward, uh, we, we kind of knew it wasn't – the problems wasn't on the offense side of the ball. The problem was definitely, you know, defense side of the ball. Uh, but, you know, this offense is still putting up points, and they're, they're just winning games. I, I think that's the only difference. Um, but once again, uh, Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, you know what you're going to get out of them. Uh, Calvin really actually, you know, didn't play, was banged up. But once again, well, plug and play Lee, uh, Brandon Powell, uh, ex Florida Gator actually coming onto the scene, yeah. um, being, you know, a, a premier slot receiver. And hopefully, you know, we talked about Kadarius Tony. Hopefully he can kind of make that transition and do the same thing. But moving forward, this Falcons offense is, is, is a okay. Um, I, I think it's definitely, you know, their problems is definitely on the defense side of the ball. And I, I think you kind of see that with the, you know, uh, the the waiver uh, of Tack McKinley. Yeah, yeah, that, that was an interesting story. You want to share that story with the folks? Uh, yeah, uh, so from, from what I was kind of, you know, diving into, he kind of made some um, tweets about, you know, being traded or, you know, his name kind of being out there on the trade block, uh, free agent type style. 
and it just seems like you know the organization is moving in a, a new direction so they they kind of waved him um in regards to those comments he made on twitter yeah he was saying i they i could have been traded for a second rounder they didn't take me ask dimitrov <laughs> like they probably don't want to put that on twitter now i'll tell you what rob the Falcons are three and six, and I'm just going to put this crazy town scenario out there. You got the Saints the next two out of three games. Should the Falcons win the next three games? Saints sandwich with the Raiders. Should they win the next three games to get to six and six? They'll have two wins over the Saints. We're suddenly looking at a wild card team. I know that sounds idiotic. I think the Saints will probably handle the Falcons, no problem. But. If the Falcons beat the Saints Sunday, I'm going to bring it up again Sunday. Just give me a heads up on that. So prepare for that discussion, okay? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that will be crazy if the if the Atlanta Falcons kind of sneak in um, in the wild card. Uh, that's definitely going to be a story that we're going to keep our eye on moving forward, Nick. You know, just when you think you know the NFL, though, you can never really predict things in the NFL because just when you think you know the NFL, it does things like this. Buffalo 44, Seattle 34. We know Buffalo's good. We know they're going to make the playoffs almost by default in the AFC East this year. I mean, who who would have thought that the, the AFC East would come down between a race between the Bills and the Dolphins? I didn't see that coming. I mean, Miami's playing some great football right now. But Buffalo just handed it to Seattle this weekend. They're up 24 to 10 at the half, 14 nothing early. Russell Wilson really struggled against this Bills defense until the second half. And, and even then, I mean, he, he was making a few mistakes. We saw some uncharacteristic uh, mistake from football out of Seattle. Four turnovers on the day. Really shot themselves in the foot a lot. A lot of good highlights from this game, though. That's the upside. But Seattle loses a pretty important game here. Uh, falls to 6-2. and two. Really could have taken an extra step in the division. Instead, they stay, they, the Cardinals are able to keep pace despite the loss. Buffalo, though, big step forward for the Bills. Hey, we, we talked about this team. Are they elite? Are they are they just good? And we've kind of settled on the just good portion. Win against the Seahawks. You, you got the Patriots monkey off your back. And now you're playing the Cardinals this weekend. I, I, I think we're going to have to start rethinking maybe up in, up in the Bills a little bit in our equation here, Rob. Yeah, I, I know we've been having that conversation the last couple of weeks if you know, if the Bills are in that, you know, elite tier of teams. And just like you said, they had the opportunity to prove it. They knocked off Seattle. Uh, I know it was a horrible game for Russell Wilson. You normally don't see him turn the ball over that many times. And, you know, actually, we, we've been talking about the Seattle's defense, but it, it really seemed like the, the offense kind of held him back, uh, you know, this week, especially with all the turnovers. But uh, just going back to Buffalo, uh, I, I think we're definitely going to see them um, – having the opportunity to kind of be in that elite team if they kind of kind of win the next couple games on their schedule. Yeah, I mean, they're right right now certainly looking like a good shot to be the number two seed. I mean, they're, they're chasing Pittsburgh and Kansas City right now, but they're only a game back in that battle. Rob, the biggest knock on Josh Allen coming out for the draft was what? What was uh, his weakness? I uh, accuracy. And, yeah. and I think that that's, that's the thing that's kind of been plaguing him, you know, this whole year, he's kind of been up plus, and down with, plus, with the accuracy. 30, 31 of 38. Yeah. Th those are, those are the games that, you know, was that he was playing at the level like early in the year and actually people was giving him MVP consideration. So when Josh Allen plays like this, this Buffalo team is going to be hard to beat. Right. But right. it's just the consistency of, of Josh Allen playing the way that he played this past week. If he can play consistently like that, it, it's going to be a tough out for this Buffalo team. But, you know, if it's Josh Allen having those one of those Josh Allen performers where, you know, he can't find anyone or hit anyone, then it's going to be a long day for the Bills. So, um, you know, this Bills team is on the cuffs of being elite, but it all falls down on, on Josh Allen and, and his shoulders. I wouldn't put my money behind Buffalo, but – what, what you basically described, you made a great point there, Rob, with the Josh Allen thing. What you're basically describing is a team that's super talented. They can keep up with these high-powered offenses, but they can also play a little bit of defense. But they got a quarterback who, if he gets hot like a goalie in, in hockey in the playoffs or like we saw with Eli Manning a couple times, uh, Joe Flacco, 
if you get hot at the right time, you could ride that hot hand to the Super Bowl. And and I think that's what we're seeing with Josh Allen and this Buffalo team. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what we're seeing right now. If Josh Allen can just, you know, be consistent and he doesn't have to be, you know, perfect. Perfect, uh, but at the end of the day, if he doesn't turn the ball over and you know he can kind of make those accurate throws, I, I think Buffalo is definitely right in the mix to to kind of make a deep playoff run. Good, good will, uh, good win for the Bills Mafia there. Uh, didn't see, didn't see that coming to that degree. Good, good win though. Uh, Chicago, they played close toward the end. It was 24-17, 17 fourth quarter points out of the Bears here, but the Titans really controlled this game from start to finish. Chicago showed up late, made it interesting to a point, but it just this game never really felt competitive, did it? It, it never really did. Um, once again, you know, Nick Foles actually, you know, threw for a lot of yardage in this game. Mm-hmm. Um, but once again, it just seems like, you know, this Tennessee team was going to win the game. I actually kind of watched majority of this game, and it just really seemed like Chicago never had an answer for Tennessee, even though Tennessee was struggling. Um, it, it really seems like a game that Tennessee was going to win, and, and they actually did do it. Uh, so this, this this Chicago team has a lot of, you know, soul searching to kind of do move forward to kind of figure out what is their identity. And I know it was rumbles of actually, you know, not playing Nick Foles, uh, you know, this week and kind of putting – going back with Trubisky, but uh, Trubisky kind of had the shoulder injury. So um, it was kind of Nick Foles. But, you know, I, I think the Chicago team was definitely not what his record said earlier in the season. Yeah. And I, I think it's actually showing up now uh, more than ever. Yeah, 5-1 and one start to the season. Now dropped the last three games to 5-4. Uh, and four. And your next game is on November the 16th against the Vikings. Rob. This Minnesota team, it's looking like trouble for Chicago. It's looking like another loss right now, isn't it? Uh, it really is, especially the way Davin Cook has kind of been running the ball. Uh, I, I think he's right now on fire. He's looking like the best running back in the NFL. Uh, I know Derrick Henry is, is right there with him, but uh, when when Davin Cook is healthy, he's, he's definitely up there. Uh, he can hurt you in both ways in the passing game and the running game. And, you know, Kirk Cousins hasn't been turning the ball over. So, you know, uh, uh, and the defense has been playing a little bit better uh, with that recipe, running the ball and, and kind of eating the clock. It's, it's, it's going to win games. And it, it really likes, it looks like it's going to be a tough game for Chicago, uh, you know, moving forward. The Ravens didn't do too, too much offensively here, but they, they did enough to get the job done. Uh, of course, they had a fumble recovery that was returned for a touchdown. Uh, early on in the game to tie it at 7-7. But just a workman-like, steady performance. They get the job done. They shut the Colts out in the second half to get a 24-10 victory. I can't say I'm overly surprised by this. I I think the Colts are, when they play the upper echelon of teams, they kind of show who they are. Um, I'm I'm not sold on this Colts team being a playoff team. Rob, how about you? Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, you know, the, the talk of the town early in the year was their defense, um, but it, it really seems like they're struggling on the offense side of the ball right now. And you saw that this past week with the Baltimore Ravens defense. They they kind of balled them up. Uh, and Phillip Rivers, uh, did, you, did you see the play where, you know, he's trying to make a tackle um, on his backside? I, I thought that, that was, was hilarious. Incredible. That was incredible. He fell on his back. He fell on his back while he's twisting and turning, trying to prevent the guy from returning the fumble for a touchdown. And he he falls on his back, and it just looked like he just his arms were about like six inches too short from grabbing the guy. Right. Yeah. Uh, that 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 was probably you know I I, I know Phil Rivers is 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 a fiery competitive guy. But that, that was definitely not a, a fiery competitive tackle attempt right there. It just kind of seemed like he just, you know, kind of olayed on the tackle and just say, you know, I, I I just let this guy score. But, yeah, it was definitely hilarious. Yeah, it was, it was interesting for sure. So, I, Indianapolis need to see a little more from them down the stretch if you're going to be in the playoffs. A team that we keep seeing play well, but they just don't win a lot of games here. The Carolina Panthers fall to three and six, but – Man, they pushed the Chiefs 
Teddy Bridgewater at one point in the game on a fourth and 14 was flying through the air like Superman. I, I mean, the Panthers battled here. Christian McCaffrey came back. I, I hear you said uh, before the podcast that you hear he got hurt again. So that's unfortunate, but you can, I'll let you discuss that when you get there. But Hey, the, the, the Panthers 435 yards to Kansas city's 397. They played right with the chiefs. Very encouraging game. If you're Matt rule, Teddy Bridgewater goes for 310 yards, two interceptions. Mahomes is Mahomes, like 372, four TDs, no picks. And the Chiefs just steadily poured it on, and, and they just stayed just step ahead of the Panthers all, all day. Yeah, uh, I, I think you have to tip your hats off to, you know, this Carolina Panthers team. I, I think Teddy Bridgewater is definitely playing some of the best ball of his, his young career. And having Christian McCaffrey back was definitely a help. Uh, you, you saw, you see him actually, you know, get into the end zone. Um, I, I think this Carolina Panthers team, they, they won't make the playoffs this year, but I, I think this organization and, and Matt Rule at the head coaching is, is just definitely a great look for that organization moving forward. Chiefs got the Raiders and Bucks to, to uh, round out November here. And uh, after we saw what we saw in the Pittsburgh the other day, I'm not so sure that the Chiefs aren't going to figure out a way to get that one seed in the AFC. They certainly look like the best team in football still. Minnesota 34, Detroit 20. The Vikings have come to life with Dalvin Cook back in the lineup. Uh, this game was really controlled by Minnesota from start to finish as well. Not a lot to say about the Lions in this one, Rob. So what do you, what do you got to say about the Vikings? Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned it, and we mentioned it earlier with Dalvin Cook. I, I helped Dalvin Cook just makes this team, you know, a complete different team. It, it takes pressure off of Kirk Cousins for throwing the ball downfield and kind of turning the ball over. So a uh, healthy Dalvin Cook is definitely scary, not only for the NFC North, but, you know, just for the NFC in general. And especially if this defense can, you know, make the turn and kind of play the way that they normally play under Mike Zimmer. Uh, I think, you know, Minnesota can probably sneak in there. Um, we, we talked about it from the Atlanta Falcon perspective. If they kind of win the next couple games, I, I think you kind of see that path uh, with the Minnesota Vikings more so with the Atlanta Falcons moving forward. The New York football giants, they get their second win of the season against the Washington football team. 23 to 20 Washington turned the ball over, turned the ball over five times in this game. New York didn't turn the ball over once. Still, it was a field goal game. Tells you that New York's probably not that good of a team, which we already knew. But Washington, poor Kyle Allen goes down in an injury that I'm not going to say it was as bad as Alex Smith, but it was pretty nasty, pretty nasty. We saw a similar injury in Florida, Georgia, that looked like it, uh, where the foot just kind of rolled around. It didn't it? Wasn't right. It wasn't right. We saw a couple of those with Dak this year. It's been it's been a tough year for the severe injuries like that. But Kyle Allen uh, apparently in the hospital getting surgery on that. So best wishes. Get well soon, Kyle Allen. Alex Smith comes in. Ugly day for Washington here, Rob. But got to feel good about that second win if you're the Giants. Yeah, you you have to. And, and every time we talk about Washington, I, I just love to see Alex Smith, you know, kind of make his way back on the field. And he threw for over 300 yards. So I think you you have to love to see Alex Smith kind of play at that that level. But once again, this was a game that the Giants should want, should have won, and they actually come out with the win. So I, I think, you know, Daniel Jones, you, you kind of see his ups and you kind of see his downs. Um, you just kind of want to see him be a little bit consistent. It, it really seems like he can kind of blossom into that Josh Allen type of quarterback, um, you know, especially, you know, with his ability to kind of tuck and run. Uh, but with that being said, one thing that he has to do is work on his accuracy and throwing the ball downfield. Um, and, you know, kind of taking those shots downfield and actually not overthrowing them like we saw in that, you know, Monday night game. Yep, yep, yep. I, th I think uh, if you're watching going forward, where's Dwayne Haskins? I, I think that's a, that's a question that, you know, a lot of fans kind of want to know. Um, but right now it really seems like, you know, Alex Smith kind of has command and control of that offense. And, you know, I, I don't know if Dwayne Haskins, you know, is still in the doghouse uh, with Ron Rivera or even if that's the thing. I know it was kind of reported, uh, but this is probably a great learning tool for Dwayne Haskins moving forward 
So he just kind of had to wait his turn right now. Um, hopefully it doesn't come down to another injury for him to get back on the field, but hopefully he can kind of get work his way back and get back as the starting quarterback. Every team in the NFC East is within one game of, of the division lead in the win column. Just still putting that out there. Always like checking in on the NFC East. Uh, the Houston Texans pretty much rely exclusively on Deshaun Watson to get them a win, which why not? You got him. You should. Uh, Jake Luton, six round pick out of Oregon State. Big fella. He looked good. He looked good for the Jaguars. Uh, he, he hung in there. He threw for 300 yards. Had a nice little spinning run for 13 yard run for a touchdown late. DJ Char, Chris Conley each catch seven balls in this game. The Jags were semi competitive, but the Houston was really pacing out front all day. Deshaun, big day, uh, 281 yards, two TDs, but really 10 receptions, 50 yards, or, or sorry, 10 carries, 50 yards on the ground. Watson did it all. Texans sneak away. The Jags had a two point conversion late to try to tie it. But the Texans hold on to get the 27-25 win. Rob, are you thinking we're going to see uh, Luton going forward for Jacksonville? I, I think we will, especially with the injury to Gardner Minshew. Uh, I, I know you know that might have him sidelined for a couple more weeks. Uh, but uh, just like you said, the, the 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 rookie looked good, especially with that 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 tuck and run move with the spin at the end. Uh, so that that was pretty interesting. That deep bomb to DJ Chark. Uh, so it, it definitely looks like he has the arm talent to kind of make the throws that you need to uh, make on the uh, you know the professional level. So uh, I, I definitely see him starting for at least the next couple of weeks until Gardner Minshew is healed up. He's got a nice arm, and he looked as surprised as anybody that he scored that touchdown at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he he actually did. But uh, once again, uh, that that was a great great run, great run for yeah. the big guy. Yeah, yeah, good good fight by Jacksonville, Houston, just a little better, just a little better. Vegas goes out to Los Angeles and gets a critical win, and Vegas are fighting for a playoff card spot, uh, a wild card spot. Five and three Raiders now, uh, 31-26 over the Chargers. Rob, Raiders, they're serious contenders in the AFC for that playoff spot, uh, for a playoff spot. How do you feel about this performance? Yeah, I, I just love the way that Derek Carr is, is playing. He, he's actually, you know, taking the leadership on a little bit more. Or that's the way it seems. And he's kind of rallying his team. And he, he's playing tough and he's showing it. So I, I think the team is just rallying behind his play. Uh, Josh Jacobs is definitely running the ball tough. And, and John Gruden's doing a heck of a coaching job. So I think this, you know, this Raiders team is definitely, you know, going to, going to knock off a, a, a couple of good teams, uh, you know, towards the end of the year. And we kind of see, see that already happening with them knocking off the, the Kansas City Chiefs a couple of weeks ago. So I, I think this Raiders team is, is, can only get better. Uh, the, the, the ceiling is, is definitely high for them. And uh, with John Gruden, you know, kind of dialing up stuff, I, I can definitely see them, um, you know, get into the playoffs and, and, and kind of, you know, upsetting someone moving forward. Yeah, we've seen the Chargers play pretty competitively with everyone, so I, I don't mind the score in this one. Good win by the Raiders. Keep the momentum going. Pittsburgh finds a way to survive against Dallas. I can't even explain this game. 24-19. to 19, Dallas looks surprisingly remotely competitive. Garrett Gilbert gets to start at quarterback. And, I mean, credit to Gilbert. I mean, this was a guy that looked good when he played for the Orlando Apollos last year. Uh, didn't see this coming, though. I it was Pittsburgh was just a little sloppy in this one. But Steelers get the win. But I, I thought the two touchdown spread, I thought they were going to cover that easily before this one, Rob. Yeah, I was right there with you. Um, especially just, you know, seeing the way that Dallas has played up until – you know, this, this week with the Steelers, uh, I definitely didn't see them being competitive, but, you know, Gary Gilbert, uh, you know, he, he actually stood in there with the, that, that, that Steelers pressure coming and he actually made some great throws. Uh, uh, but it definitely seemed like, you know, Pittsburgh was kind of sleepwalking. It came out flat, got punched in the mouth and then big Ben kind of got rattled and kind of got beat up and kind of, you know, was, was playing, playing through, through injury for the most part. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the Steelers defense is, is an elite defense, uh, especially, you know, you know, playmakers on, on all three levels of the, of, of, of the ball. So 
uh, it's going to be hard for Pittsburgh to kind of lose uh, those games that they expect to win by double digits just because their defense is going to keep them in it. And, and that's what kind of happened. Uh, but once again, Dallas did, was competitive and they did put up a good fight. So, but Pittsburgh is one of those elite teams that we talk about, Nick. Just gonna, it just goes to show this ain't college football. This isn't, it's, there's never Alabama versus Van, Vanderbilt on the field in the NFL, right? But we're going to see, uh, we're going to see the Steelers go up against the Bengals, keep, keep perfection on the line. Then the Jaguars, the final, final week of, uh, or the next two weeks here. And then the final week of, uh, of November, they play the Ravens again. So good chance for the, the Steelers to potentially go into December undefeated. So that'll be interesting to see if they can keep up. And hopefully this was their sleepwalk game and they can get together a little bit uh, going forward so that they can really make a run at perfection. Cause that's always fun to see. It's always fun when it gets late in the season, you got a team that's got a shot to do it. All right, let's stay out West here. Uh, let's go further West. Actually Miami 34, Arizona 31. We said it on our podcast last week. We thought this was going to be one of the best games of the day, and it sure was. It really lived up to its billing. I, this game was going back and forth. Tua gets to actually play a little bit this week instead of have, instead of just relying on his defense. 20 of 28, 248 yards, two TDs. Kyler Murray, very similar numbers, 21 of 26, 283 yards and three TDs. No interceptions for either quarterback. Clean game, clean game. Kyler Murray also had another 106 yards on the ground while Tua adds 35 on the ground. This was an absolute barn burner with two quarterbacks of the future, Rob. This is the future of the NFL we watched on, in this game, right? Yeah, uh, that that's what it definitely comes down to. Uh, you know, two quarterbacks, uh, both of these guys are under six feet. Uh, we, we know the running ability that, you know, Kyler Murray possesses, but uh, did you see a couple of runs that Tua had? Uh, it definitely looked nifty. Didn't look like the hip was bothering him um, that that much at all, if if not at all. Um, and we we know what Tua can do for the pop, pocket just from the RPO game. Uh, but yeah, this is definitely going to be a matchup moving forward. Uh, two two MVP uh, candidates moving forward. Uh, hopefully, we get to see this matchup a lot uh, in the next couple of years. Tua spreading the ball around. We we already know the Dolphins play pretty decent defense. I take the 31 points with Arizona with the grain of salt because Arizona's got a good offense, but Dolphins play pretty respectable defense. But Devontae Parker, six receptions. Preston Williams, four receptions. Mike Gusecki, three. Jakeem Grant, four. That's spreading the ball around, man. We haven't seen this out of Miami uh, in the in the past, and I think now that you're putting a little threat on the offensive side of the football to go with a, a good defense, hey, Miami – is one of those playoff threats in the East now. We have to put Miami in the playoff conversation now. Not only to get the wild card, but they're nipping on the heels of the Bills. They're only one game out. They're only uh, a game and a half out with Buffalo. I guess technically two games because one of their losses is to the Bills. But they should have an opportunity. They got the Bills. Just want to note they got the Bills on the final game of the season. So if they can get it back to within a game and they play Buffalo on the final game of the season, that could be a huge game on January 3rd week 17 so kudos on miami for uh recovering and playing well um this one i didn't see coming sunday night new orleans 38 to 3 against tampa i was so disappointed rob we even bumped the podcast to monday night so we can really sit back and enjoy this game and it it was trash it was trash game from start to finish i mean if you're a new orleans fan you probably love every second of it and I, i'm i'm not a bucks fan for the record i i live in tampa I'm a, I'm a Jaguars guy, but I, I still, I was hoping to watch a good football game. Tom Brady, Drew Brees. Instead, we get treated to a total blowout. Yeah. Uh, once again, just like you mentioned, we, we, we actually pushed the, the pod back uh, because we definitely wanted to dive in and kind of watch this one from start to finish. And it was definitely disappointing. Uh, you know, Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers didn't come out to play. Uh, but one thing that really, you know, that caught my attention was the chemistry of Drew Brees and, and Michael Thomas. It just really seemed like he's been playing all year. Uh, that's just the, the chemistry and connection that they have. Uh, but I, I think the Saints kind of took them to the woodshed. And it's, it's definitely going to be tough for Tampa Bay, um, you know, from a, a mental standpoint, if they have to see uh, the, the Saints in the playoffs. 
Uh, so I don't think, you know, it's, it's hard to beat a team three times in a row, but if the, the cards lay out where, where the Saints have to be, uh, play Tampa Bay in the playoffs, I'm definitely going to give the edge to uh, the Saints in this one. It, it's, it's just a mystery to me because I, I really thought Tampa was playing some good football. And then the last couple of weeks here, you barely escaped a pretty bad Giants team. You only put up, uh, what is it, 194 total yards. But, I mean, even on a third and goal, I saw Gronk drop a touchdown pass. I mean, sometimes when you compete, it's just not your night. Last night, definitely fit that bill for Tampa. But really a critical loss because the Saints jumped to 6-2. and two, The Bucks fall to 6-3. and three. Hey, you can forget the number one seed now if you're Tampa. You can kiss the number one seed in the NFC goodbye. You're playing for the number two seed at best. And I'll tell you what. I'm not feeling good about your division chances right now either because you're technically, even though you're only a half game back in the in the losers column in New Orleans, you're you're really they got a two game edge on you from the, the head to head battle. So not a good look if you're uh, Tampa Bay. And the other thing that's even worse is after the game, Drew Brees is doing an interview and Jameis Winston comes over and he he does the eat the W thing again. You remember that horrible pregame speech from from a couple years ago? Yeah, yeah, definitely horrible pregame speech uh, then, but but more hilarious and funny now. Uh, and that was definitely probably a shot at Tampa Bay. Um, you know, Jameis Winston just being on the Saints and, and not, not having nothing to do with the game, but, you know, kind of reaping the benefits of Drew Brees going out there, playing a clean game and, and coming up with a win. Uh, but, yeah, I, I would have definitely loved to see Drew Brees eat the W. That that would have been, you know, even better. But I did get to see Sean Payton doing some dancing after that um, in the locker room. So did you get the chance to see that one, Nick? No, I did. Did it look like all those college coaches that can't dance? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, pretty much. But uh, it, it's definitely glad to see, you know, these coaches kind of get into it with their players and, and just kind of have fun. And, and that was definitely a big win. I, I know – a, a lot of people is going to say, oh, it's just another regular season game. But I, I really think kind of Drew Brees took that one personally, especially, you know, the seesaw battle of him and Brady going back, of you know, throwing being the all-time, you know, touchdown leader. So I think this was a little bit more personal to Drew Brees, and he actually played that way. And great, great, great asset to have if Michael Thomas being back. So uh, I, I think the Saints team is, is definitely going to be rolling moving forward. Saints are suddenly on a five-game winning streak, and Tampa. More, just, just lots of questions for the Bucks here. I'm not, not sure what's going on there. That, that's a mysterious one to me. They got uh, Carolina, the Rams, and the Chiefs, and the next, and the Vikings the next four weeks. So suddenly, that's a, that's a tougher looking stretch than we thought a couple weeks ago. So Tampa's got to bounce back here if they're going to keep pace with the Saints. The Saints. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. They got two of the next three games against the Falcons with the Broncos sandwiched in between. So definitely a winnable three game stretch for New Orleans to keep it, to keep it rolling. Rob, we're not usually on Monday nights, but since we are the jets pulling off a surprise here, it's only in the third quarter right now while we're recording, but they're currently up by 10 in new England. I, I'm not going to give anything to the jets because they're the jets and I'll, probably assume the Patriots will end up winning anyway, but there's certainly Jets are certainly in good position to pull off a win tonight. Didn't see that coming. Yeah, I I'm right there with you. Didn't see that one coming. Um, it, I haven't watched too much of this game, but I, I know Sam Darnold, um, you know, he, he sat this one out due to injury and Joe Flacco. I mean, it, it never hurts to have a savvy veteran in there with, with experience. And, and that's what it seems like is, is going on with this game. It seems like Joe Flacco, you know, with experience is just kind of galvanizing the troops and just, you know, going out there playing. Um, they, they have nothing to lose right now. And, and it, that's what it seems like they're doing, just going out there to play a game and, and they're having fun with it. Well, I think after the Patriots got toasted against the Niners a few weeks ago, people realized, oh, this is a different Patriots team. And, this is obviously a hard hit team by all the opt outs and everything. And I, 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 I suspect we're going to see new England bounce back in 2021. How about you? Yeah, I, I definitely expect a bounce back. Um, you know, weird year, not only for the Patriots, but just, just for every other franchise as well. Um, yeah, this, this is one of those off years for the Patriots, but they, they, I could definitely see them bouncing back. Um, great organization. They're they're going to get the pieces that they need to 
to kind of get back into contention. Um, and it's definitely is going to be sooner than later. Well, Rob, that brings us to our Did You Know question of the night brought to you by Coach Paint. And I want to know, when was the last time the New England Patriots had a losing season? And we will cover that right after this break. Yeah, 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 yeah. to add graphics to player highlight clips similar to the graphics you see on TV. Coach Paint offers the ability to clearly telestrate uh, video while increasing <laughs> All right, before we went to break, I asked, when was the last time the New England Patriots had a losing season? Uh, yeah, Nick. So, uh, I'm actually, I, I'm very confident in, in Tom Brady, you know, being there for pretty much, you know, 17, 18 years. So I don't think Tom Brady has ever had, had a, a losing season, um, in his career. So with that being said, you know, that means 17, 18 from 2020. So I'm going to say, 2001, 2002 season uh, before, you know, Brady got the nod. So you're close. It was Belichick's first year in 2000. And I believe the Patriots won the, their first Super Bowl in Belichick's second year in 2001. It was that first Super Bowl with Tom Brady. So you're right. Brady never had a losing season. I guess I thought I was thinking of the Matt Castle season, but they just didn't make the playoffs. They went eleven and five that year. Yeah, they they went eleven and five that year. So I I know that's the 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 year that kind of catches you know everyone's attention when Brady goes down with the you know the knee injury. But once again, you know, plug and play. Uh, Bill Belichick being one of the you know the best coaches you know in the history. And, you know, Matt Castle comes in there and go 11 and five, but they, they missed the playoffs. But yeah. uh, that was definitely a winning year for, you know, the Patriots. Yeah. Yeah. So Patriots looking like they're well on their way to their first losing season since 2000 when they went five and 11. All right, Rob, you want to read us out? Uh, yeah. Um, once again, we'd like to appreciate our listeners for listening to this episode of American Football Stories. You guys can find us on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Please subscribe and rate us five stars. Follow us on Twitter at American FB Stories and check out our website at AmericanFootballStories.com. Once again, my name is Robert Parker III and my co-host is Nick Newton. Thank you for listening and tune in to next week's episode. You play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. That's the great thing about sports. You play to win. And I don't care if you don't have any wins. You go play to win. When you start telling me it doesn't matter, then retire. Get out. Because it matters. I hope there's Bigfoot. I don't think there is. The reason I don't think there is, because we found bones of dinosaurs and everything else, but we haven't found bones that I've heard of, of Bigfoot. I'm very upset. We should have been in a ball game with fast field goal. The coach had sent him in. We shouldn't have sent him in. That's a damn coaching mistake. That the kids are playing their tail off, and the coaches are screwing it up. He's got to stop that little inside trap. You know, the option didn't hurt as much. We played pretty hard. We just got to stop that inside thing. Offensively, we kind of sputtered around, got the ball in the end zone. But, you know, defensively, we got to get out off the field on that two-minute drive. Key injuries to your offensive line. What do you do in the second half? Oh, we're going to go play. We just got to keep playing. Thank you, Coach. <laughs> he has a magnificent personality, I'll tell you <laughs> 
we receive a lot of mail during the course of the season, and uh, uh, a lot of it's good mail, a lot of it's bad. And one of the one of I the I would say <laughs> that most of it is good, though, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, I yeah. think I think so. I say 95 to 98 percent of the mail we get is always good. But the one question that keeps coming up, where Woody Hayes' name is involved, they say you're a man of no mercy, uh, and yet, <laughs> you know, frankly, I don't care much what they think. <laughs>